Okay, so we, uh, we rejig the order of this, so Francois talks about the adaptive optics first, because it's critical for the things that I'm going to talk about uh, presently. Does that do what it's meant to do? Yeah. So, uh, a lot of people ask what I do for a living. I build instruments as well as doing science. Um, what are astronomical instruments? Well, uh, basically you can think of what we do as building very expensive digital cameras. So this is the very expensive digital camera my wife forced me to buy for her last year. Cost a lot more than she said it was going to. Um, this is the very expensive digital camera that took some of those pictures Francois was showing you a little while ago. It was built by the ANU um, for, to go behind the AO system on Gemini in, in Chile. Uh, this cost about $1,000. Uh, these detectors over here cost about a quarter of a million dollars each. And as you can see, we stuck four of them together to make this camera, wrapped it all up inside a package we designed on the mountain, shipped it off to Chile and put it on the back of the telescope. So that's what one of the things that our instrument group do on Mount Stromlo. We build expensive digital cameras for the telescopes. So why do we want pictures? Well, pictures can tell you an awful lot of things about what's going on in astronomy. This is one of my favorite pictures uh, in astronomy. It's a picture of the antenna galaxy taken by one of the cameras on the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, this presentation doesn't do it justice here. You really should look this up on your computer at home. Um, and I know from experience, from looking at this, that the blue bits are all regions of stars that are actively forming in galaxies. The red bits are old stars that are being smashed together in the center of these two galaxies. And the brown bits are dust that's getting in the way and making it difficult to see what's going on. Um, but the problem with pictures is they don't quite tell you the whole story. There's really something else we'd actually like to try and do with instrumentation, uh, as John alluded to earlier. Uh, and really, that's, that's spectroscopy. That's the heart of what I spend my, my, my day job doing. So you're all familiar with spectra. Uh, here's a, a natural spectrum occurring. Uh, using all the atmosphere's natural spectrographs, or, or raindrops, as we call them normally. Um, here's the same thing being created in the lab by a, uh, a little glass prism. So we shine white light in one end, and it comes out as a little rainbow. Um, white light is just made up of lots and lots of different colors. And the different colors of light, the different ratios of intensity of these different colors, Tell us about the physical processes that's causing that light to be generated in the first place. And so by looking at the distribution of light in these sorts of systems, we can tell a lot about the physics of the objects that we're looking at. Uh, just very quickly to talk a little bit about what spectroscopy is, there are three basic types of spectra. So here we have a continuum spectrum. Good examples would be daylight or the sun or looking at a light bulb. Uh, we have emission line spectra, which don't have the continuous colors. They have very discrete colors. And examples there would be be neon lights that you see uh, in shops and things. Uh, they're neon if they're red. They're other atoms if they're made of different, if they're coming up with different colors. Sodium street lights or sodium laser guide stars, as you heard about previously. Uh, fireworks as well. The colors in fireworks come from these uh, emission line spectra of individual elements that are inside the firework. Uh, or the Orion Nebula is something that I'd spend most of my time looking at. Um, and the third type of, of spectrum is absorption spectrum, which are basically where we look at a bright thing. Uh, like uh, uh, an astronomical object in the background, and we look at the bits of light that are missing because that tells us about what's in between us and the background source, and that's an absorption spectrum. Uh, everyday examples of that is what you'd see if you were to look at clouds with a spectrograph. Uh, so the way to think about spectra is it's the DNA fingerprint of a galaxy. So here we have another galaxy. Uh, this is what it looks like as a picture. Um, this is what it looks like as a spectrum. Now, I don't expect you all to know what's going on in that, but I know because I've looked at hundreds of thousands of these things over the last three years that you can tell information about how many stars it's forming, how fast it's forming stars. The shape of this spectrum down here tells you about how old it is. The shape of these absorption features over here tell you about what sort of stars it's made up of uh, and how much gas is flowing out of it at the moment. So by staring at these things in detail, you can look at an awful lot of what's happening inside galaxies and how they're evolving. Uh, we also do redshifts with galaxies, uh, so we did a lot of uh, observations with the instruments that, that John was talking about, measuring the redshifts for, for galaxies. We can see here a galaxy that's nearby. I know that this emission comes from hydrogen because of the pattern of the light that comes out of that galaxy. This galaxy is further away, so it's at a higher redshift, so the lines come in at a different place. And by measuring the redshifts of these sources, we can measure how far away they are. We can work out how the universe is growing, uh, and Brian Schmidt can win Nobel Prizes, which was very nice. Uh, but can we combine the two? That's what we'd really like to do. Can we take a picture and have a spectrum? So here in the background, we have a picture of another galaxy I like. It's the Cartwheel Galaxy. It's actually a picture taken in x-rays, but it's a really good color for these presentations, so I'm going to use it. Uh, what we'd really like to do um, is find a way of taking one of John's fibers and putting it in the middle here and recording the middle spectrum of this galaxy and taking another one of John's fibers and putting it in the outskirts of this galaxy. And in the middle, it's bright red which tells me that it's a very old spectrum full of lots of old stars it formed a long time ago. Uh, and in the outskirts, it's blue, 
which means it has one of these blue spiky spectra, which means it's full of young stars, it's actively forming stars, and it turns out in this case it's because we just smashed this little galaxy through the middle of this other galaxy, and we can learn the story of what's happening in that galaxy. What we'd really like to do is tile the whole galaxy with little spectra and record a spectrum from every place in that galaxy. So John was talking about measuring individual galaxies all over the sky. I'm talking about measuring one galaxy in enormous amounts of detail. The two are very, very complementary. John's going to find the things for me. I'm going to measure them in detail. We need both, and that's why we build both. So we've been doing this at Mount Stromlo for a very long time. Uh, this is uh, an image of the, the NIFS instrument uh, that went off to Gemini uh, in 2004. Here it is being mounted on the telescope uh, in Hawaii. It's one of Gemini's most productive instruments. It was built on Mount Stromlo, destroyed in the fire, and then rebuilt on Mount Stromlo afterwards. Uh, here's the ANU's uh, own Weiss instrument that's on our telescope up at Siding Spring. uses a lot of the technology that we went into this instrument, uh, and we built our own smaller one for our in-house telescope for the research students to use. Uh, these are, uh, are now aging instruments. They've, they've had most of their productive life. It's time to build the next generation of these instruments. But what they told us was how to do this right, how to do this properly, and how to scale it up to make this thing. So this is what the optics for this new instrument we're building will look like. I don't expect you to understand what's going on here. I know I don't a lot of the time. Uh, this is what the instrument actually looks like. Uh, you can see that uh, basically uh, computer-aided design packages have moved on quite a lot since we built the first generation of those instruments. To show you what it looks like in a bit more detail, um, it's about two meters across. Um, it's going to weigh about two tons. It has to be sucked down to about a billionth of an atmosphere inside. Uh, we need to cool it down to about minus 200 degrees and keep it there at about 0.1 degree stability. Um, has to have things that move inside it to precisions of about a micron, so the same sort of precision that John was achieving with his fibers. Uh, and the whole thing's going to cost about $25 million when we build it. Uh, to go on the telescope in 2023. Uh, this is where it sits in the back of the telescope. So we've seen GMT a number of times here. This is it with the mirrors taken out. Uh, there's two places that instruments go. Very large instruments go at the back and look straight through the hole in the middle of the telescope. Smaller instruments that require higher precision but smaller fields of view uh, sit on side this rotating part of the telescope on a layer above these larger instruments just behind the mirrors that have been removed so you can see what's going on here. This is the very first component of the instrument, so this is a real thing. We bought and polished this just recently. It turns out to be a lot better than we thought it was going to be, which is great because that solves all sorts of problems for the next stage of design. This is the first piece of the optical instruments for the adaptive optics program at GMT. They've built some of the primary mirrors already, but this is the first piece of optics for one of the instruments, so we're quite proud of it. What's it going to do? Uh, well, there are a number of science programs that we're trying to achieve with this instrument. Uh, some of them we've heard about before. We're going to try and measure planets around distant stars. Chris has got some excellent programs we'd like to do with that. We can also use my instrument uh, to weigh black holes by measuring how stars in the middle of galaxies move around. We can measure the, the masses of black holes in the center of very distant galaxies. Uh, we can record how star formation works uh, across the distant universe. We can get so far back in time that we can measure most of the star formation over the history of the universe and work out how that fits uh, into the big picture in cosmology. We're hoping to be able to catch gamma ray bursts as they explode at the beginning of time. Uh, our telescope is so big uh, and has been designed in such a way that we can slew it to the right position so quickly that we think we should be able to get on to catching these things uh, when the universe was really uh, incredibly young. And then we can study the absorption of the rest of the universe along the line of sight to that object. Uh, but most importantly, there's a whole stack of things that we probably haven't thought of yet. And so one of the things we spend a lot of our time doing on Mount Stromlo is making sure that we design an instrument to be flexible so it can do the things that our astronomers haven't thought of right now. I think that's all I had to say.